Uh, really good to be here. We're rounding off the series of, on Proverbs today. We're running across this term. And um, I'm going to be rounding off today by thinking about our obsession with physical beauty and the effect of that, the consequences that arise from that. And we're going to start in a passage. I actually read a bit of this passage a few weeks ago when I spoke on, uh, on marriage. Before, it's going to be from Proverbs 5. Um, before we get into that, I just want to bring a quick reminder that Proverbs is being written from a father to his son. And so it comes from a male perspective. So, for example, where it warns about an adulteress, you could apply it both ways. So if it was being written to a woman, you could equally talk about the adulterer. So I just want to make that clear again. We've said it a few times through this series, but just worth making that clear. So I'm going to be reading some extracts from Proverbs chapter 5, and they should come up on the screen as well. Starting in verse 3. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? So it seems that our starting point is sex, which seems to be a recurring theme for me in my talks. I seem to keep coming back. It's like everything revolves around it, but it's not, it's not the point. You know, um, I, I believe it, the, it's nice that the cool is working, the chill is working this week, but it's about to get hot in here. Um, no. The point of today is not to be a sex talk, actually, but it is a good starting point for where I do want to go, um, because the devaluing of sex in our society, and by that, by devaluing, I don't mean that people want it less, I mean kind of the degrading of of sex in our society is, I think, a symptom of a much deeper issue um, of something that we greatly overvalue, which is physical beauty. And so we'll look at those two areas, the devaluing of sex, the overvaluing of physical beauty, and then we'll come to how we break out of that and how we can be different from the world, which, of course, is what we are supposed to be. So the passage I just read is clearly about the destructiveness of adultery. The writer's saying, you know, avoid it at all costs, at all costs. Now, he acknowledges the attractiveness of it. He, he, he understands why people get lured there. He says her lips drip with honey. She has speech smoother than oil. There is an attractiveness. There's a luring. But he's very clear. In the end, it's as bitter as gall. What promised to be sweet will become as bitter as gall. It leads to death. It's utterly destructive. It doesn't deliver what it promises. So stay away. Avoid it. Don't go near the door of her house. Whatever you do at all costs, stay away. But he knows, the writer understands human nature being what it is, that when we try to avoid something, it tends to lead us further into temptation. So he kind of says, do the negative bit of avoiding, but also do the positive bit of rejoicing so much in your own wife that actually adultery stops being attractive. It loses its allure. He says, drink water from your own system, you know. From your own, with your own wife. He, interestingly, verse 16, 17, he's very clear. He, he's basically saying, this isn't to be shared with anyone. Your springs shouldn't overflow in the streets. Basically, casual sex is out. Don't, don't even think about it. Don't go there. He says, rejoice in the wife of your youth. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. The point being that if in your marriage you are so intoxicated, so captivated by your spouse... Nothing else gets a look in. And by the way, this is being written into a context where marrying for love and marrying for companionship wasn't really the norm. Marriage was about social position or economic security. Marriages would often have been arranged and you'd have got the romantic bit of it from having a mistress. So this is radical stuff in the context that it's written in as well. Many commentators note the sexual imagery that is being used here as well. Um, wells 
and fountains being symbols of female and male sexuality. We're not going to dwell on that uh, too much, but the point being, sex here is being described in really quite erotic terms. There's a rejoicing going on here in sexual pleasure with your spouse, and there's no prudishness about it whatsoever. And you find that's the case throughout the Bible. Just go and read Song of Songs. God has a high view of sex, and he has a high view of marriage. Now contrast that with Proverbs 30, verse 20, which says, This is the way of an adulteress. She eats, or an adulterer, he eats. She eats and wipes her mouth and says... I've done nothing wrong. And so we go from this high, lofty, soaring view of sex that's full of rejoicing and celebration and beauty and poetry and and all the rest. We go from that to sex as appetite, sex as consumption, as routine. I feel hungry, I eat. I feel sexy, I have sex. What is the big deal? It's the same problem that Paul was addressing with the Corinthian church in the New Testament. It's the same problem that we have in our society today where sex has been turned into a product. It's a commodity, something that is to be consumed to meet my needs. If you think about the relationship, a consumer relationship between a customer and a vendor, if the quality of the product goes down or if the price gets too high, you're going to go somewhere else as the customer because your relationship with the vendor is actually about the product. It's not about the person. And so my rights and my needs are more important than being loyal to you. Contrast that with a relationship that's commitment-based rather than consumer-based. In a commitment-based relationship, the relationship is an end in itself. It's not about what I can get from it. But I think in our society, relationships have generally become more consumer-based, even in families sometimes. You know, as long as it's meeting my needs, I'm there. When I find I have no further use for you, you probably won't see me again. You know, I'm out. It's the product, not the person, that matters. It's the same in romantic relationships. Sex has been turned into a product, a commodity. As long as it's satisfying me, as long as it's good, then I'll stick around. As long as there's not too high a price to pay, it doesn't get too complicated, then I'll stick around. But the Bible's very clear that you can't do that. You can't separate sex from the whole person. In Genesis 2, it talks about becoming one flesh. You know, a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There's this mystical bond that goes on, this union that happens that goes way, way beyond any physical act, any purely physical act. And Paul expands on that theme in his letter to the Corinthians. He talks about sex and the body and how you get joined to another person. So according to the Bible... You, you can't separate the thing, these things out. And so you, you really mustn't give sex without giving the whole of yourself or receive sex without receiving the whole self of the other person. In other words, you need to be married. And that marriage commitment is essential because what do you say in marriage? You're saying, I give myself to you completely. I give myself to you unconditionally. I'm totally committed to you now and I will be in the future. I'm promising to love you come what may. Whether uh, you, know, you have a midlife crisis, whether we experience good times or bad times, whether we go through richness, poor, uh, sickness, health, I am committed to you and I will be committed to you as long as we live and that's it. I will put your needs first. That is what you're promising in your marriage vows. And if you've not made that marriage commitment, then actually you're still holding on to your own life. You're still really reserving the right to get out rather than share the control of your life with another person. And so in that regard, sex outside of marriage really becomes more about an exchange of products than an exchange of selves. In essence, saying, I want the product, I want the pleasure, but not you, ultimately, Now, of course, I understand for some that might be very offensive, what I've just said. Maybe you're in an unmarried but long-term relationship. Maybe you live together, whatever. And you might say to me, I am committed. I love, I really, really love her. I really love that person. Why do you need to be married to show that? And listen, I'm not saying you don't love the other person at all. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying there's not a degree of commitment there. But you haven't fully given yourself. Because otherwise, why not get married? What are you afraid of? You haven't fully given yourself. 
And in biblical terms, sex is so precious, there's such a high view of sex that it absolutely requires that commitment of giving the whole of yourself and receiving the whole of the other person. And in our society, as in society through the ages, sex has been devalued and degraded by being turned into a product, into a commodity. Now, I did say I didn't want this to be a sex talk, so let's change tack a little bit here and turn to the heart of the issue, because this is a heart issue. Jesus is very clear about that. He said in the Sermon on the Mount, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. There is a heart issue going on here, most definitely. You see it. Any time adultery is committed, you see, you, you see that this is a heart issue. Because if, if you were about to commit adultery, and you could at that moment see very vividly, very clearly, the destruction that you are about to cause, that this act of adultery is about to cause to you, to your family, uh, to the other person, their family, if you could see that clearly, surely you would never do it. You really would stay away from it. But there's something in us, it's that self-centeredness in us that blinds us to that as desires take over. We are creatures of desire. Desire becomes very, very strong in us. So somebody committing adultery will find a way to block out all logical reasons why this shouldn't happen, why they shouldn't do this. Knowing the devastation and the destruction this will bring, but finding ways to justify that. I'm lonely. I, my marriage isn't meeting my needs. She understands me. Nobody else. My wife doesn't get me. She don't, my wife doesn't understand me. This is the only person who understands me. I find comfort in her. And so it's, it's all about me. It's the universe revolves around me and my rights and my needs. And so it becomes a consumer relationship, what I get out of this, which is the opposite to a marriage relationship. But of course, we know, as the writer says, this is something that promises to be sweet. It will turn very, very bitter indeed. But what's at the root of this? Where does adultery start? Where does any sexual immorality start? Well, I think it starts with looking. I mean, that's what Jesus said. I tell you, if anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, you've already, you've already gone there in your heart. It starts by looking. The word that's used in Proverbs 5 is captivated. Don't be captivated by an adulteress. Well, where does, how do you get captivated by something? Well, usually because you start looking. Something catches your eye. Something catches your attention, and you then choose to give it your attention. You choose to focus your gaze there, and you look, and you keep looking, and you look a bit more, and then you indulge thoughts that arise in your mind, and you let your mind run away with you, and you build it up, and you build it up in your mind. Proverbs 11, verse 22 says, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Which is an interesting one, isn't it? But there are a couple of perspectives that you can look at that from. You can look at it from the perspective of focusing on the woman and maybe say, well, it's her lack of discretion which mars the beauty which is inherently in her. Maybe that's what it's about. But I think there's another perspective you can look at this from, and it's from the point of view of the one who is looking the one who sees this shiny, beautiful gold ring, and it's so beautiful, and I must have it. And so you reach out to grab it. I've got to have this. It's so beautiful, not realizing that it's attached to a filthy great pig that's been rolling around in the mud and in its own slops. And so you reach out for beauty, and you end up with a pig in your lap, and you're covered in mess. It's a bit like King David, you know, one of Israel's most well-known kings, King David, who's up on the roof of his palace one day, and he sees Bathsheba, uh, who is married to somebody else, and he sees her bathing. I tend to think it's probably not an accident. He found himself on the roof at that point. He'd probably seen something before. But anyway, he sees, he looks, she's, she's gorgeous, she's stunning, and in his mind, he lets his thoughts run away, and he's like, I have to have her, and he's the king, so he does. He, he sends for her. Or, or King David's son, Amnon, who is, we're told, is so captivated by his half-sister Tamar, he becomes obsessed. He makes himself ill with this obsession, with this desire he has for her, and he works out a way of getting her on her own, and he rapes her. And it's lust. It's lust, and it starts with the eyes. It starts with 
letting your attention be taken by something and indulging that, seeing something beautiful. But lust always promises what it can never, ever deliver. If I could just have that, this is what we do, if I could just have that, then I would be happy. I would be, I'd be happy, I'd be satisfied, I'd be fulfilled. But in David's case, adultery led to murder of Bathsheba's husband and it led to the death of a child. In Amnon's case, no sooner has he raped Tamar than in the very next verse it says, Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. So she's become an object of disgust to him. From being this object of intense desire, she's become an object of disgust. Lust promised satisfaction, but it delivered destruction and it delivered shame and and hatred. Now, of course, lust isn't just limited to sex. You know, probably most of us can identify with seeing something that we consider to be beautiful, some, maybe something in the shop, and it just catches our attention, and, and, and you kind of you, you see it, and it might be something as banal as a pair of trainers, or an iPad, or in my case, a Krispy Kreme donut, <laughs> or a car, or something like that. But, but you, in your mind, you, you look and you think, oh, that's like, you know, I have to have it. Even though you can't afford it, even though you don't have the money. And so logic goes out the window, but desire takes over. I think we can recognize a bit of that in ourselves, where we see something and it's like, I've got to have that. That will make me happy. And so we have it. And we realize, actually, after a couple of days of wearing the trainers, they're just a pair of trainers. Um, logic goes out the window. Desire takes over. You know, there was once a married couple who got so captivated by a bit of fruit on a tree. We're told that it was pleasing to the eye. It looked good, and it was desirable for gaining wisdom. And suddenly, all the beauty of creation wasn't enough for Adam and Eve, because we have to have that. All of this stuff that they've got, this, uh, this perfect beauty, this perfect creation they have, but it's we have to have. That's the one thing we're not supposed to have. That's the one thing we really, really have to have. We really want that. And of course, it didn't deliver what it promised. It delivered devastation with long-reaching consequences. We have an obsession with physical beauty, with what things look like. While we've devalued sex, we've also greatly overvalued sexual attractiveness and physical beauty. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen, I'm sure some of you will have seen, this film called Shallow Hal. Um, if you haven't, we're just going to play a, a clip from this film. It's just a clip from the trailer, because it just gets at the heart of what I'm talking about here. So if you could play that. a dream. Every man has a fantasy. Every man has an image of the perfect woman. Who are you going to get? What are you talking about? It never occurred to you to think the girl is only on their lips and may not be the best way to go about it. But one man is about to get a whole new perspective. How are some of you a great favor? Really? This moment on, never need someone in the future. Only to see an interview. This fall, I gave him the ability to see interviewing a part for soul. He hypnotized you. You're saying all the pretty girls I've met lately they aren't really pretty. How you are soon is David a vision that only he can see. Okay. All right, so, um, you know, Hal, of course, ends up falling in love with this woman who he would never have even given a second thought to before because external beauty is taken out of the equation for him. The, the sad reality of our society is, is that inner beauty generally is, is not really valued that much and external beauty is worshipped. It's worshipped. We, we live in a world where people are evaluated and judged based on looks, based on their body shape. All sorts of things like that, which is ridiculous, really, because actually what is beautiful depends on where you are in the world. So someone once did a study on the different body shapes, men's body shapes, women's body shapes, that are considered beautiful in different parts of the world. And there's a huge, huge variation. So um, you, can, you can look this up on Google. So, for example, in some places for women, unrealistically skinny is deemed to be beautiful. And in other places, it's all about the curves. Um, for men... Here, I don't know, people may be more attracted by the kind of, sort of chiseled six-pack look. I have decided to be a non-conformist. Um, 
Although, based on the study, it seems I may be fairly popular in Nigeria. <laughs> so, I think there may be... So, you have to confirm that to me if you are from Nigeria. Um, but this... This obsession with physical beauty, it plays out in all sorts of ways. So, for example, one way this plays out is tying, when we tie our sense of self-worth, our sense of identity to what is on the outside. Probably this is more prevalent among women, but not exclusively. But it's this kind of thing of, well, look, why should I care about my character when no one else is. You know, when, when people only look at the outside, well, that's what I'm going to focus on too. That's what I'm going to care about. And so it leads to... It, everything becomes about desperately trying to look good and to, to lose weight or to, to have the best clothes or to look young and stay looking young and then feeling miserable and defeated because you can never look good enough or you can never lose enough weight and if you do, you put it back on and you can't stop aging. Nobody can stop aging. And so you tie your sense of significance and identity to something you can't control. I read about someone whose child asked her, what does sexy mean? What does the word sexy mean? And I thought the response was a good one. She said, sexy is when it feels good to be in your own skin. I think there's a lot of truth in that. There is an attractiveness about people who are comfortable in their own skin. There's a beauty that shines out. But the culture of physical beauty wages war against that idea. Everything is stacked against feeling comfortable in your own skin. And women particularly, but many men as well, seem to live with a constant sense of dissatisfaction about what they look like, about their appearance. I mean, it's the question that all men dread and makes you come out and sweat. Does this make me look fat? The answer is no. Immediately no. No pause, no hesitation. Don't say, um... (laughs) You know, don't say it's not the clothes that... no. You just say no. But we sit, the point is, we see it all around us. We see this manifesting itself in, in this dissatisfaction with our appearance. Now, another way that this obsession with physical beauty or with sexual attractiveness uh, shows itself, plays out, is in the whole area of pornography, which is more prevalent among men, but again, not exclusively. Pornography promises an escape. It promises intimacy. It's a false intimacy. It promises intimacy without the complications of actually having to go out with a real, a real person. But of course, it's a trap. Pornography is a big trap. It, it's an, it becomes an addiction. And before you know it, you have guys spending hours on the internet feeding this addiction, feeling disgusted by themselves, and yet unable to stop. And that results in feelings of shame, and that will manifest itself in all sorts of ways, angry outbursts and all this kind of thing. But you feel unable to stop. And pornography, apart from having that damaging effect on, on, on the person, it has other damaging effects. So one is that it paints a false picture of sex. So there's been a lot of research done on the effects of pornography, and I remember reading somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, but about the effect of teenage boys in terms of what they expect their girlfriend to do for them. And quite often the girlfriend giving into that because of insecurity, they don't want to lose him. Or you hear stories of girls texting a picture of themselves, an explicit picture of themselves to their boyfriend, only to find when the relationship ends, or sometimes when the relationship hasn't ended, that that photo has been distributed, or it's been put on social media, and it's just utter humiliation. It comes back to lust. It comes back to this obsession with physical attractiveness, with sexual attractiveness, and it leads to, to destruction and degradation and shame and humiliation. And of course, another damaging effect of pornography is that it paints an absolutely false picture of beauty itself, because it's fake. It's utterly fake. This is what a journalist called Naomi Wolf wrote in New York magazine. For most of human history, erotic images have been reflections of or celebrations of or substitutes for real naked women. In other words, it was the real thing that was better than the image. For the first time in human history, the power and allure of the images have supplanted that of real naked women. Today, real naked women are just bad porn. That was written in 2003 in New York Magazine. How much worse is it now? How much more accessible is the whole range of internet pornography now? And all of this has a dehumanizing effect because 
Because we are carriers of the image of God. That's what makes us human. We carry the image of God. And we have exchanged the beauty of God's glory and his image in us for physical beauty. We've exchanged something that is eternal and eternally glorious for something that's temporary and subjective. And you see it all over the place. You see it in how people determine who they're going to go out with. Who am I going to date? And a lot of people probably reject out of hand 80% of the opposite sex because they're just not their type. They don't, they don't look right. Not have a clue what they're like, but I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even consider you. There's a, there's a very popular dating app called Tinder, which works in the, in, in the sense that it, it brings up on your screen a photo of other Tinder users who are also looking for dates and that sort of thing in your area, and you swipe right if you're interested, and you swipe left to reject. It's like, yeah, I'd, I'd have that one. Nah, not interested. It's horrific. There are TV shows that are all about rating people based on their physical looks. And, you know, it's not an abnormal conversation among a group of lads to watch a woman pass by in the street and then go on and rate every single one of her features like you might rate a car on Top Gear. And so this leads to people who are made in the image of God being treated as objects and sex being treated as a product and people tying their identity, their sense of self-worth to what they look like. So this obsession with physical beauty has a dehumanizing effect on ourselves and on others. And I think it's really utterly offensive to God as well. So how do we get free of this? How do we change our mindset here? Well, one thing I do know is that just trying harder won't work. So if you go away from here and think, you know, yeah, I'm going to try really hard not to visit that website. I'm going to try really hard not to feel terrible about myself because of how I look. That won't work because actually there's something else behind the obsession with physical beauty, which is that we're all trying to hide something inside, a sense of shame inside. This goes all the way back to Genesis 3, where you have Adam and Eve. They're naked and unashamed. They're completely free to be all that God has created them to be. And then they sin. Then they feel shame for the first time, and they cover up and they hide. And humans have been covering up and hiding ever since, putting on a mask for the world to see to cover up a deep sense of shame that we carry around inside. It's also, of course, in that moment of sin that human mortality became a real thing. And so we live with a fear of our own mortality. This is why we want to stay young. It's why we have this obsession with looking young. It's why people will sometimes trade in their spouse for a younger-looking model, I think is the phrase. Obsession with staying young. We want to be with someone who is beautiful or we want to be beautiful ourselves to cover ourselves up, to hide shame and to avoid contemplating our own mortality. So how do we break out of that? Because here's the thing. In the face of what we see as reality, the truth can appear rather insignificant. The truth of, you know, you say, oh, but God doesn't see you like that. Well, to somebody who's feeling terrible about themselves, that it kind of seems to bounce off in the face of what they see as reality. The truth can appear rather dull, rather grey, rather monochrome. It's like, yeah, I know Jesus loves me, blah, 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 but I feel terrible. I feel so unhappy because I look like this, or I can't get that person to notice me, or I can't stop visiting those websites. And so you end up with this monochrome truth. Truth that should be beautiful and radiant becomes monochrome, and you have a vividly, colourfully deceptive beauty. Monochrome truth and vividly deceptive beauty. Now, in Greek mythology, Orpheus was sailing past the island of the Sirens. And the Sirens were these beautiful female creatures who could play music, they could sing to enchant the passing sailors. And the sailors would hear the voices of the Sirens and be so captivated and so driven mad by desire that they would steer towards the island and they would get shipwrecked on the rocks. But Orpheus was a brilliant musician. And so when he heard the the voices of the sirens, he took out his lyre, stringed instrument, and he started to play music that was louder and more beautiful, and it drowned out the voices of the sirens. So Orpheus turned his attention intentionally. He turned his attention. He didn't let himself be captivated by this. He turned his attention to something that was more beautiful, to something that was more captivating, more worthwhile giving his attention to, and that's the same as we need to do as well. We need to do that. We need to turn our attention to what is really beautiful, even though it may not feel beautiful right now. And so what we have then is, instead of monochrome truth, we have beautiful truth. Truth that 
is beautiful. We see that the truth is beautiful. We see actually there's nothing more beautiful than the truth of who God is and who we are in him. And then that in turn gives us access to a truthful beauty, not a deceptive beauty. So we have beautiful truth and truthful beauty. And so where do we turn our eyes to find that beauty? Where do we, where do we turn our gaze? Well, consider this. And it is considering. It's about considering. It's about reflecting. It's about meditating on truth. It's what it means by be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's that you meditate on what is beautiful and lovely and true, and you throw out lies. That is how we get transformed by the renewing of our mind. So consider this. In Ephesians 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You know, God portrays himself as our lover. You know, he puts the redemption, Christ's redemption of the church in the context of marriage between a man and a woman. He portrays himself as our lover, and he made us to be his lovers. Not subjects, not slaves, but lovers. And he came, and he died, to make us beautiful, to make us radiant, to make us spotless. God always wanted us to see him as the ultimate beauty, That was the relationship he wanted with us. But of course, we turned away. We gave our hearts to other things. And so he didn't give up on us. He came for us. He came to redeem us. He came to get us back. And he came to take every single blemish, every single stain upon himself so that we would be beautiful again, so that we would be radiant, so that we would shine again. But here's the thing. In doing that, the way he did that, he turned all ideas of beauty on their head. Because in Isaiah 53, it tells us, when it's talking about the Messiah, it says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Uh, Contrary to some of the film depictions, Jesus didn't come as a physically beautiful man. And interestingly, the words that are used here in Isaiah 53 for beauty and appearance are the same words that are used in Genesis 29 when it's describing Jacob. And you have Jacob, who is madly in love with Rachel. Rachel has an older sister called Leah, who Jacob definitely doesn't want. And it says in Genesis 29 that Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. It's the same two Hebrew words used there to describe what Rachel was that also describe what Jesus wasn't in Isaiah 53. Now, Jacob wanted Rachel. He was desperate to have Rachel. He was captivated by her. If I could just have her, that would be great. I would be be happy then. That's all I want. But if you know the story, and it's quite a soap opera of a story, Jacob gets tricked into marrying Leah first. And then a week later, he's allowed to marry Rachel. But Jacob ignored Leah. He never wanted Leah. He rejected her. But the amazing thing is that God chose Leah to be the one through whom the Messiah would eventually come. Through her son Judah. So God chose the ugly one. He chose the one who was unattractive in the eyes of the world. He, particularly if you put her side by side with her stunning sister Rachel. So Jesus deliberately comes as a type of Leah, not Rachel. The one no one wanted the one with no beauty or no majesty to attract us to him, an unremarkable-looking man with a common Galilean accent. And yet we know that he is the most beautiful person in the universe. Jesus is the most beautiful person in this universe, and yet we we rejected him and we killed him. But the incredible thing is he did it willingly. He went through that pain, that suffering. He went through the cross willingly to make us beautiful to make people marred and corrupted and made ugly by sin, to make us radiant and spotless and blameless and holy. Now that is beautiful. Jesus came as a lover to make us lovers. That is beautiful. That is beauty that is linked with redemption that blows our obsession with physical beauty out of the water. That is beautiful, beautiful truth, that if we let it, will generate a truthful beauty in us, that will create in us such a desire for him, such a desire for his beauty, that it will completely drown out and overcome 
our desire for earthly things and earthly beauty, however strong those desires may be. And when you grasp this truth, when you grasp that actually he came to make you beautiful, when you realize that he comes for you now to do the same, in fact, he comes for the one in this room who feels the most guilty right now, maybe because you've messed up sexually or you're addicted to pornography or because you just realize you're shallow, he comes for you right now to make you beautiful. He comes for you to transform you. When you truly get hold of this beautiful truth and you realize, I am loved. I am so, so loved. That puts an end to shame. There's no more shame. And so you no longer need to cover up and hide and put on a mask. And when you realize that because he was raised to life, I will be raised to life with him. I will be raised into an imperishable, new, glorious body. It puts an end to any fear of mortality that we may have and the obsession with looking and staying young. This is truth that transforms, because it's not about external beauty that is temporary and fleeting and it's constantly fading. This is about the image of God in us that he has gloriously redeemed. That is the only beauty that is eternal, that is eternally glorious. This is beautiful truth that gives us truthful beauty, and if you let it, that truth will transform you and it will bring you freedom.